Okay, all right, so uh, you all know me, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm presenting uh, reducing the effects of signal, multipath fading, and RSSI distance estimation using Coleman filters. Uh, I want to go ahead and preface this as I didn't get to revamp it for the Southeast Comp presentations. This is pretty much my, uh, what I presented for my research aptitude test. Uh, had a little issue with it being a little confusing in the order that's presented, so I'll try to, uh, on the fly, sort of correct any confusion that's coming up. Uh, so what we're going to present here is uh, first the introduction to what we're doing. Uh, we're going to look at radio propagation models for uh, detecting distance from uh, signal strength from a wireless signal. We'll look at common filters. We're going to look at how we've configured the common filter for uh, this application. We're going to look at modeling and simulating the RSSI data uh, and look at the results and the conclusion and talk about some future work. So for uh, introduction, uh, this project is mostly for localization applications. So it's a very common application in wireless sensor networks, use in robotics and anything, anything where you want to do tracking based on uh, uh, signal strength for wireless signal. Uh, different methods are used currently. Uh, very common methods include uh, packet time of flight. Uh, some people also include uh, sending packets along with an ultrasonic sensor, so you can use the time of flight from uh, the uh, sound. Uh, it's, people use RSSI fingerprinting, which is a received signal strength indicator over a, uh, over a map. So you have a set map and you go around and you sense uh, the signal strength at each point as you build a map and as you move through, as you see different changes in signal strength, you match that up with the changes in the map. Uh, we also have RSSI distance estimation, uh, just estimating distance from how much the signal has decayed over uh, the displacement between the two transmitters. Uh, RSSI distance estimation has the simplest requirements, however, it suffers greatly from multipath fading in indoor environments. So what is multipath fading occurs when uh, transmission finds multiple paths to the same uh, receiver. So as you see in this uh, figure here, if you have like a hallway or something, uh, the signal will bounce off the walls if it's reflective enough and will come back to the receiver at the same time and it will either cause a sudden increase in signal or decrease in signal. And it can also phase shift and uh, but that's not particularly, uh, it has no real effect on um, distance estimation from RSSI alone. So a couple of the radio propagation models that are used, we have a free, sa free space propagation model. Uh, this accurately describes the loss of signal strength over distance when you're in a completely open environment. Uh, so if you're in a really wide open outdoor environment, this works reasonably well. Uh, but that's generally not very uh, realistic. There is a two-ray ground reflectance model, uh, and this is used in conjunction with uh, knowing the distance your transceivers are above the ground, and then it will uh, estimate where multipath fading effects will occur uh, by when the signal hits the ground and bounces back. Uh, this is used a lot in like cellular towers and stuff, so like when Google's tracking your every motion as you're moving around the city, it's, it uses this to get a, or I guess it's more Verizon, uh, using this technique to track where your cell phone is. Uh, this is good over long distances, but in short range environments like indoors, uh, it doesn't do, it doesn't work well at short distances because it sort of cancels out the signal um, when the math works out. So what we have to use for indoor environments, we use a log distance model. Uh, this is a model that can be configured with a couple parameters to match the environment that you're operating in. So uh, it just fits a logarithmic curve to the decay that you would expect to see from between transceivers uh, over a certain distance indoors. Uh, the equation is as follows up here. We have uh, RSSI received signal strength equals 10 times n to the log base 10 of the distance D plus A. So uh, RSSI is expressed in negative dBm. Uh, N is a path loss exponent. So these are one of the variables that you could figure for the environment that you're operating in. The 
to use the distance between the transmitters, and A is a reference value, uh, which is typically taken uh, for, if we're getting our output in meters, you take it at your, um, uh, at a set point away. So we do like, if we're doing meters, we take the RSSI at one meter away, and we use that as sort of a reference point. Uh, so if you were to do something like, if you want to do it in feet, you might take it at one foot away or something like that. Uh, but generally meters is what everybody wants these uh, values in. So uh, for configuring the log distance model, you, uh, well, the best way to go about it is you can rearrange the formula to uh, get uh, distance out of it. So you have distance equals to, is equal to your RSSI value that's received minus the reference value divided by 10 times uh, the path loss exponent. Uh, I have a table here with uh, path loss exponents, sample of values for different indoor environments. So you have for like free space or an urban area or highly shadowed, which is a very reflective environment. Um, and uh, in building line of sight. So generally you take around two for most indoor environments. Okay, so shifting gears a bit, we're going to talk a little bit about the Kalman filter and what it does. Uh, the Kalman filter is a algorithm which recursively estimates the state of unknown unknown environments or variables in the system. Uh, these uh, variables can be this is highly configurable, so you can use it for a variety of different applications. Uh, so what we mean by uh, state variables. In this case, it's going to be we're going to measure distance and change in distance is sort of the velocity between uh, two uh, trans transceivers that might be moving around. Uh, common filter also assumes that these uh, state variables are have Gaussian noise associated with them. And there's two parts of the common filter. One where it does a prediction based on the uh, dynamics of the system that you give it, and then a measurement update where it corrects predictions made by uh, the dynamics of the system with actual measurements uh, from uh, sensors. Uh, so before I get into this, uh, back to the, the Gaussian noise, one thing that makes common filter work is the assumption that everything is Gaussian distributed uh, uses the property where if you have two Gaussians and you multiply them together, if they're very widely distributed, even if, even if both Gaussians are widely distributed and you multiply them together, it becomes more certain. Uh, so you get a higher peak and you get a smaller uh, standard deviation. Uh, so that's sort of the core thing here is we take multiple uncertainties and they might be uncertain in different ways and you combine them and you get a more certain estimation of state variables. So the prediction step, uh, we're going to go through each one of the lines of the Kalman filter, it's only a uh, few. Uh, the derivation is very involved so we're not even going to like talk about where these come from but we're going to talk about what they do. So the prediction step is based on a state transition model. Uh, estimates the next state, state of the system based on system dynamics. So what we have here is we have an x where you have x of k given k minus 1 where k is sort of the iteration or the time step that we're currently on. So this x of k, k minus 1 is the, is the value of x at this iteration given the previous value of x, which this is, uh, this comes from f times k of, uh, or f of k, well, uh, the f doesn't actually change between iterations. So f, which is the, your uh, state transition model, times your previous state, previously uh, estimated state value. Um, then we also have uh, u and b, which are a control vector. Uh, we're not using that for this uh, implementation, so I'm going to skip on that for now. But what F does is F takes the state variables and it's a matrix that just makes a prediction. Uh, so given your current state and the dynamics of the state, it will give you the estimation of what the next step should be. So if you're moving, so in our example, we're going to be doing distance and velocity. So if F is the 
distance and velocity prediction. It's just going to look at x. Say, okay, so if x is moving at this velocity and we're currently at this position, uh, f just takes those two and then updates it. So it says we're still moving at a certain velocity and it updates the position based on how fast you were going for this specific example. It could really be configured for about anything, but that's in a nutshell. F is just making the prediction for X, the new X. Uh, then we also have another line here. This is a, uh, uh, we have P, which is our state covariance matrix, and then we have Q, which is a process noise. So using the same uh, system dynamics, uh, P is a, uh, what's the word, uh, like a diagonal matrix where each value along uh, P contains the uh, the variance for each uh, for each value in the state matri uh, the state variables, and then each other is the covariance state variable. In uh, uh, but what's mostly important is the diagonal values. So this updates the the variance of each of our variables, which is expresses how uncertain the Gaussian distribution is for each variable. And then we add in Q, which is an assumed noise for that model. Q is something that you either need to estimate yourself or kind of tune for your system. And that's done by, you could, half the time people just measure the variance in their system and then add that for Q. So that tells them how erroneous their predictions might be. Okay, so the next step is the measurement step, where we take sensor measurements or um, uh, sensor measurements and then get the difference between that and our predicted values. So we take, for this line here, we have Y, which is going to be our error, Z, which is our measurement vector, and then H, which is our observation model. So we take our currently estimated, our predicted X, we use H, which is a matrix that pretty much just reshapes X into the form that Z uses. So, for instance, if you were tracking position and velocity with X, but you're only measuring velocity, H would just be removing the position variable and just getting the velocity from X and getting the difference between X and Z. And then that goes into Y. So Y is your difference between your prediction and your measurement. Then we go down to uh, the next line where we get S, the innovation matrix, which relates the covariance of state variables to the measurement vector. Um, so this takes our uncertainty of our, uh, of our current estimation, which is contained in P, gets it into the form using H uh, that we use for measurement that is defined by Z, and then we add R, which R is our noise. So if we have a noisy signal um, and we know about how noisy it is, we just kind of inject that in there. And then that turns into S, which S is used in the following line to get our common gain. And the common gain tells us how much of our new measurements to incorporate into, how much to correct our current estimate from prediction phase. Um, and so that works out in this math here. Uh, then we go down to the next line where you have the final estimation of X, which is our predicted value plus the amount of corrected value that we get from our Coleman gain. And then we also update the, uh, uh, the covariance matrix as well based on uh, the uncertainty from the noise from the measurement along with uh, the, the, from the amount that the common gain specifies. So, anyways, that's common filter. If you haven't seen that before, that's uh, probably a little confusing. Uh, so using common filter, what we're going to do here, we're going to configure it to uh, reduce the noise that we get from multipath fading. So a common filter can use a model of the dynamics of the mobile node, which can be used to make predictions about the mobile node's position when distance estimation isn't reliable. So what, what I mean by this is whenever we go into an area that has high multipath fading and we get sudden spikes in the data from our distance estimation, it's, it's unreliable. 
if we go by that measurement alone, it seems that like if you have a robot that's moving around with a wireless transceiver on it and it's talking to all these other transceivers, it's going to see these spikes. And according, if you're just looking at those measurements, it looks like the, the, the robot just went 100 miles an hour suddenly and just speeded up. That didn't happen. So what we want to use is the, uh, the model of the state dynamics to uh, predict where the robot should be whenever we see that the data has, the measurement has become unreliable. So how we're configuring this, uh, we have state variables, uh, we are tracking the distance between two transceivers, we're tracking the velocity between them as it changes, and we're doing that for each node in a network. So if we have up to n nodes, our uh, state vector is going to be 2n uh, by 1. Uh, so we have our state transition matrix. Uh, so here you can see how we have the distance and velocity modeled with f. So the, if we just consider this segment of the matrix right here, you have, if you were to multiply this part of the matrix just by the first two variables in the state variable, you get the distance is equal to the distance plus the change in time uh, by the velocity to get the increased distance and the velocity is just added to itself. So it just stays the same. And so with this matrix, we're able to just make a prediction based on the current velocity that the nodes have between each other. Uh, so the measurement vector, since we're using a distance estimation model from RSSI data, we have just those distances that are in Z, our measurement vector. And then H, again, is just a, uh, just a matrix that has a one in every other place along the diagonal to essentially just strip out the velocity measurements because that's not something we're measuring, we're only measuring distance. And then we have Q, which is our process noise. So Q is adding noise based on our predictions and we're only making predictions about uh, the, as you can see it corresponds, there's a one in each place here. So uh, one's just kind of a, a dummy value right now. If this were a real implementation, you won't take measurements and set that to some uh, closer value, but one is, is a good ballpark estimate for this application. Uh, and then we have R, which is our measurement noise. Now I mentioned earlier what we want to do is we want to detect when we're in an area that has high multipath fading. And this is done by keeping a brief history of measurements that we've seen and then a slight gain value to make it a little more effective. So what happens is whenever the robot moves into an area and we look at the measurement and it says it's like accelerated to a thousand miles an hour out of nowhere, we know that's not true. Uh, what we do is we take the difference between the current estimate and sort of a history that we've been tracking that we average together and that difference is multiplied by a gain and that's added to the noise. So we're artificially boosting the noise uh, of the measurement which comes from multipath fading and that causes the common filter to not trust the measurements and rather than using a measurement to determine the position it starts trusting the prediction of where it thinks the node's going to be during next iteration rather than just incorporating that from the measurement. Uh, so we'll make that clear a little bit later as well. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the simulation environment. So uh, in MATLAB, we generated some RSSI data for a certain number of meters at a 0.1 meter resolution. Uh, this RSSI data is based on the, a calibrated log distance model. Uh, from actual indoor tests, so we went around in several hallways around here and had uh, took measurements so many meters away and took that, fit a model, then used that model in MATLAB to generate fake RSSI data. And this RSSI data was then perturbed with a regular noise that you would expect to see, like a just a white noise on the signal, and then injected uh, multipath effects, so just like random spikes that would jut up and down unexpectedly to totally ruin your distance estimation. And we can kind of see that here. So 
Um, on the left side, we've got uh, the RSSI data gathered from the outdoor tests. So this blue line here is the actual, like this is just being outside uh, and moving it away. And you can see it fits that logarithmic curve. This red line here is our calibrated model very well. Um, and so this is uh, the x-axis is distance and then the y-axis is uh, pretty much the attenuation and negative dBm. Uh, and then on the right side, we have from an indoor test. This is in a hallway, and then you can see the, the multipath effects just cause the data to just go all over the place. Um, it's, still it's still noticeably centered around that logarithmic uh, model, but it's, it's unusable at this point. So taking the terrible data from an indoor environment and that fitted model, we then put that into MATLAB add a little bit of noise on it, and then added these multi-path spikes. And we try to add big ones so that a lot of other papers you'll see when the people are filtering multi-path effects, they got little tiny, like nothing really uh, um, realistic. But uh, we want to make this work in the most terrible of environments. So we injected these huge spikes in the data. So in the simulation environment, we generate a mobile node, which is moving around a bunch of static nodes that are sitting there and just taking measurements in each iteration. And in each iteration, it puts those values into the Kalman filter, and the Kalman filter then uh, just iterates and updates, makes predictions, takes in the noise, um, or takes in the uh, measurements. And this is what it looks like. So what we did, you see uh, on this, uh, uh, graph over here, we have, you can kind of see this little black X here, that was the starting position. This red line is where the mobile node moved around in the environment and ended up in this spot where it began. And then three nodes are randomly generated, three static nodes. Uh, and this can be configured to however many nodes you want. Um, so I just did three because it's easy to visualize. And on the side here is the RSSI uh, data for each of these three nodes. So each one has kind of random, randomly attenuated data at, at different points. So whenever this thing moves around in the environment, it takes a measurement to each one of these three nodes, and that's pretty much like uh, a lookup table over here. So it just kind of looks up to see what the RSSI value should be for each one of those as it moves. So in the simulation environment, it, it drives around, it's taking these measurements, and then it's common filtering them. So throughout the, uh, the simulation, you see these three graphs on the side. This is the distance to each one of those nodes with the actual data, the modeled, the data, the estimated distance from the, uh, from the log distance model and the Kalman filtered value. So if you see at the top, there's a green line that goes to here, that's the actual distance. Then the red line is just from the log distance model, so it's got these huge spikes. And then this little blue line is the Kalman filtered uh, value. So what's happening here is whenever it sees like a crazy, crazy measurement like this one up here, it knows it increases the, um, the R value, which is expressing the variance of that uh, of that signal and it knows not to not to trust it and so it works on its prediction instead so instead of shooting up here with the measurement the blue line the estimated uh, the filtered position stays a little closer to the true value um, and if it's in a huge highly highly uh, multipath faded area it's it's still it, it's going to go up a little bit because there's it's a one dimensional piece of data. We don't have too much we can work with. So, uh, but when it gets like little spikes, which are still pretty large spikes in the data, it stays a lot closer to the true value. And even then, when it starts to creep up, this is a lot better than going off the model alone. Uh, so here's the uh, results and conclusion. We've got uh, the mean squared error for each one of those nodes and their distance estimated to it. Using the model alone, you can see that the common filter uh, reduces the error fairly significantly. Um, so for future work, uh, some things that need to be refined are how much 
history we need to save for each node. So depending on how quickly the mobile robot's moving through the environment, uh, it will determine how much history that you're probably gonna need to detect when you're actually in a multipath place and you're not actually speeding up. Uh, also need to identify uh, how much uh, gain to apply to that noise as well because we're sort of artificially boosting it right now. It might not even be necessary if you're uh, keeping track of the proper amount of history you need for the speed of the robot. Uh, then we also need to actually quantify the process noise uh, variable which uh, was that Q matrix that we showed that just had ones in it as a placeholder. We also need to integrate a method to recognize RSSI attenuation due to no line of sight. So what we've looked at here at multipath, but you can also like go through a door and still see the same signal on the other side of a wall. And then how do you tell when something's behind a wall and to rule out that measurement? Um, and then also need to select an algorithm for localizing the mobile node. So integrate, such as integration with uh, some sort of SLAM algorithm might be on a mobile robot. Uh, and there's my references. So. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I think that was way longer than I should have been. <laughs>